In the ancient Egyptian city of Edfu, an inscription on the temple walls describes a conflict that is otherwise known as the First Pyramid War. Quote, In the year 363, His Majesty Ra, the Holy One, the Falcon of the Horizon, the Immortal who forever lives, was in the land of Kim. He was accompanied by his warriors, for the enemies had conspired against their lord. Horus, the winged measurer, came to the boat of Ra. He said to his forefather, O Falcon of the Horizon, I have seen the enemy conspire against thy lordship to take the luminous crown unto themselves. Then Ra, the Holy One, the Falcon of the Horizon, said unto Horus, the winged measurer, Lofty issue of Ra, my begotten, go quickly, knock down the enemy whom you have seen. End quote. The war had its origins in the Anunnaki struggle for control over Earth and actions taken by Ta, also known as Enki, and his son Ra, also known as Marduk. Manetho, an Egyptian priest who lived in the Ptolemaic kingdom in the early 3rd century BCE, explained that Ta turned over the dominion over Egypt to Ra after a reign of 9,000 years. However, 1,000 years after Ra took control, his reign was cut short by the Great Deluge. The Egyptian god Shu, known as the god of air, took over control after Ra and reigned for 700 years. Following Shu was the reign of Geb, which lasted 500 years. According to scholar Zechariah Sitchin, it was at that time, circa 10,000 BCE, that the Anunnaki space facilities in the Sinai and the Giza pyramids were built. Sitchin explains that the Anunnaki spaceport in the Sinai Peninsula and the Giza pyramids were supposed to remain neutral under the aegis of Ninharzag, but Enki and his descendants had really no intention of relinquishing control over these installations. A Sumerian text known as the Paradise Myth, also known in ancient times as Enki and Ninharzag, presents a record of the politically motivated deal between Enki and his half-sister Ninharzag pertaining to the control of the space facilities in Egypt and the Sinai Peninsula. The text is set in the time after Earth was apportioned between the Anunnaki, giving the Sinai Peninsula to Ninharzag and Egypt to Enki's clan. The tale relates how Enki crossed the marshy lakes that separated Egypt and the Sinai Peninsula and seduced Ninharzag, ultimately impregnating her. As Sitchin points out, Enki's real intention was to obtain a son, but the offspring was a daughter. Enki then had intercourse with the daughter as soon as she became young and fair, and then to his granddaughter. Enki's sexual activities resulted in a total of eight gods, six female and two male. Ninharzag was furious with Enki's incestuous behavior and used her medical skills to sicken him. Despite the appeals from those Anunnaki who were with Enki as he lay stricken, Ninharzag would not help him. She declares, quote, Until he is dead, I shall not look upon him with the eye of light. End quote. Ninurta, Enlil's son, went to the Sinai Peninsula to investigate what had happened. Subsequently, he returned to Mesopotamia to report the developments at a meeting attended by Enlil, Nana, Utu, and Inanna. Enlil was unsatisfied with Ninurta's report and ordered him to return to Tilmun and bring back Ninharzag. However, in the meantime, Ninharzag had changed her mind and healed Enki. After she cured him, Enki proposed that the two of them assign tasks, spouses, and territories to the eight young gods. Let Abu be the master of the plants. Let Nintullah be the lord of Magan. Let Ninsutu marry Ninazu. Let Ninkashi be she who sates the thirst. Let Nazi marry Nindara. Let Azamua marry Ningazida. Let Nintu be the queen of the months. Let Inzag be the lord of Tilmun. According to Sitchin, Egyptian theological texts from Memphis likewise held that there came into being eight gods from the heart, tongue, teeth, lips, and other parts of the body of Ta. In this text, as in the Mesopotamian one, Ta followed up the bringing forth of these gods by assigning abodes and territories to them. Quote, 
After he had formed the gods, he made cities, established districts, put the gods in their sacred abodes, he built their shrines and established their offerings. All that he did to make rejoice the heart of the mistress of life." End quote. It is no surprise that rivalries developed as a result of such confused parentages. Perhaps the most significant rivalry was the Osiris-Seth conflict, which stemmed from the assertion that Osiris was truly the son of Ra and not of Geb, conceived when Ra had come by stealth unto his own granddaughter. Seth had been allotted Upper Egypt by Geb, but he was more interested in Lower Egypt, which was granted to Osiris. The main factor for Seth's interest in Lower Egypt was the Great Pyramid and its companions at Giza because he knew whoever controlled them would in turn control the space activities of the Anunnaki on Earth. Sitchin explains that for a while Seth succeeded in his ambition, but in the year 363, following the disappearance of Osiris, the young Horus became the avenger of his father and launched a war against Seth. This was the first pyramid war and also the first war in which the gods involved men in their struggles. Horus, with the support of other Inky gods reigning in Africa, began his campaign in Upper Egypt. Utilizing the winged disc that Thoth had fashioned for him, Horus advanced northward toward the pyramids. Sitchin contends that this major battle took place in the Water District, the chain of lakes that separates Egypt from the Sinai Peninsula and a good many of Seth's followers were slain. After peace negotiations failed, Seth and Horus engaged in personal combat in and over the Sinai Peninsula. Seth did not fare well in the battle, and as a result, the Council of Gods gave the whole of Egypt to Horus. Seth was subsequently banished from Egypt and withdrew east to the Asiatic lands. Besides the space facilities in the Sinai and Giza, there was also a need for a new mission control center to replace the one that had existed before in Nippur. The necessity to equidistance the control center from the other space-related facilities dictated its locating on Mount Moriah, which means the Mount of Directing. This new construction site would become the future city of Jerusalem. According to both Mesopotamian and Biblical accounts, this site was located in the lands of Shem, which was controlled by the Enlilites. But Biblical accounts explain that this territory ended up under an illegal occupation by the line of Enki, the Hamitic gods, and by the descendants of the Hamitic Canaan. The Old Testament outlines how Canaan, son of Ham, was singled out for the special rebuke that his descendants were to be subservient to the descendants of Shem. The explanation in Genesis really does not make that much sense. It says that Ham, not his son Canaan, had inadvertently seen the naked genitals of his father Noah, but as a result, Canaan is the one cursed. Sitchin points out that the true answer lies in the supplemental information in the ex-biblical book of Jubilees, where it becomes clear that the real offense was the illegal occupation of Shem's territory. After mankind was dispersed and its various clans allotted their lands, the Book of Jubilees relates, quote, Ham and his sons went to the land which he was to occupy, the land which he acquired as his portion in the country of the south. But then, journeying from where Noah had been saved to his allotted land in Africa, Canaan saw the land of Lebanon, all the way down to the river of Egypt, that it was very good. And so he changed his mind. He went not into the land of his inheritance to the west of the sea, west of the Red Sea. He dwelt instead in the land of Lebanon, eastward and westward of the Jordan." End quote. His father and his brothers tried to dissuade Canaan from such an illegal act. Quote, and Ham his father, and Cush, and Mizraim his brothers, said unto him, Thou hast settled in a land which is not thine, and which did not fall to us by lot. Do not do so, for if thou dost do so, thou and thy sons will be fallen in the land, and be accursed through sedition. For by sedition ye have settled, and by sedition will thy children fall, and thou shalt be rooted out for ever. Dwell not in the dwelling of Shem, for to Shem and his sons did it come by their lot.
end quote. Were he to illegally occupy the territory assigned to Shem, they pointed out, quote, Cursed art thou, and cursed shalt thou be beyond the sons of Noah, by the curse which we bound ourselves by an oath in the presence of the holy judge, and in the presence of Noah our father. But Canaan did not hearken unto them, and dwelt in the land of Lebanon, from Hamath to the entering of Egypt, he and his sons until this day. For this reason is that land named Canaan. End quote. Sitchin posits, quote, Behind the biblical and pseudo-epigraphical tale of a territorial usurpation by a descendant of Ham must lie a tale of a similar usurpation by a descendant of the god of Egypt. We must bear in mind that, at the time, the allotment of lands and territories was not among the peoples but among the gods. The gods, not the people, were the landlords. A people could only settle a territory allotted to their god, and could occupy another's territory only if their god had extended his or her domain in that territory by agreement or by force. The illegal seizure of the area between the spaceport in the Sinai and the landing place in Baalbek by a descendant of Ham could have occurred only if that area had been usurped by a descendant of the Hamitic deities, by a younger god of Egypt. End quote. The First Pyramid War could very well be viewed as a skirmish in comparison to the second one. Moreover, it can be reasonably argued that Seth's banishment during the first conflict is what brought about the second one. Seth's trespass into Canaan meant that all the space-related sites came under the control of the Inky gods. It was a situation that the Enlilites could not abide, and about 300 years later, they launched a war to eject the illegal occupiers from the vital space facilities. The Second Pyramid War is described in several texts, including the original Sumerian, and later in the Akkadian and Assyrian renderings. While scholars refer to these texts as myths, they are really chronicles of the war to control the space-related peaks, which included Mount Moriah, the Harzag, which is Mount St. Catherine in the Sinai, and the artificial mount, the Eker, which is the Great Pyramid in Egypt. The texts make it clear that Ninurta commanded the Enlilite forces in the Second War, which started in the Sinai Peninsula. After the Hamitic gods were beaten there, they retreated to the mountain lands of Africa. In the second phase of the war, Ninurta carried the battle to the strongholds of his foes through a series of vicious and ferocious battles. The final phase of the war was fought at the Great Pyramid, which was the last and impregnable stronghold of the Hamitic gods. It was there that Ninurta besieged his opponents until they ran out of food and water. Hymns to Ninurta contain numerous references to his feats and heroic deeds in this war. A great part of the psalm, like Anu art thou made, is devoted to a record of the struggle and the final victory. But the principal and most direct chronicle of the war is the epic text Lugal Ud Malambi, which consists of 13 tablets, best collated and edited by Samuel Geller. King, the glory of thy day is lordly. Ninurta, foremost, possessor of the divine powers, who into the throes of the mountain lands stepped forth. Like a flood which cannot be stopped, the enemy land as with a girdle you tightly bound. Foremost one, who in battle vehemently enters. Hero, who in his hand the divine brilliant weapon carries. Lord, the mountain land you have subdued as your creature. Ninurta, royal son, whose father to him had given might. Hero, in fear of thee, the city has surrendered. O mighty one, the great serpent, the heroic god, you tore away from all the mountains. While this chronicle highlights Ninurta's feats and his divine brilliant weapon, it also describes the location of the conflict, the mountain lands, and the principal enemy, the great serpent leader of the Egyptian deities. It identifies this adversary several times as a Zag, and once refers to him as a Shar, which are both well-known epithets for Marduk. These lines make it clear that the two principal sons of Enlil and Enki, 
Ninurta, and Marduk were the leaders of the opposing camps in the Second Pyramid War. The second tablet of the text describes the first battle. Ninurta's advantage is attributed to his godly weapons and a new airship that he built for himself after his original one had been destroyed in an accident. It was called the Imdugud, usually translated as Divine Storm Bird, but which literally means that which like heroic storm runs. Its wingspan was about 75 feet. Ancient schematics depicted it as a mechanically constructed bird, with two winged surfaces supported by cross beams, an undercarriage reveals a series of round openings, perhaps air takes for jet-like engines. The aircraft bears a remarkable resemblance not only to the early biplanes of the modern air age, but also an incredible likeness to the sketch made in 1497 by Leonardo da Vinci depicting his concept of a man-powered flying machine. Sitchin reveals that the Imdu Good was the inspiration for Ninurta's emblem, a heroic lion-headed bird resting on two lions or sometimes on two bulls. It was in this aircraft that Ninurta soared into the skies during the battles of the Second Pyramid War. He flew so high that his companions lost sight of him. Then, the texts relate, in his winged bird against the walled abode he swooped down. As his bird neared the ground, the summit of the enemy's stronghold he smashed. While his enemies retreated, Ninurta kept up the frontal attack. Simultaneously, Adad roamed the countryside behind the enemy lines, destroying the adversary's food supplies. In the Abzu, Adad the fish caused to be washed away, the cattle he dispersed. When the enemy kept retreating into the mountains, the two gods, like an onrushing flood, the mountains ravaged. As the battles extended in time and scope, the two leading gods called on the others to join them. My lord, to the battle which is becoming extensive, why don't you go? They ask a god whose name is missing in a damaged verse. The question was clearly also addressed to Ishtar, for she is mentioned by name. In the clash of weapons, in the feats of heroeship, Ishtar, her arm did not hold back. As the two gods saw her, they shouted to her, Advance hither without stopping, put your foot down firmly on the earth. In the mountains we await thee. The weapon, which is lordly brilliant, the goddess brought forth. A horn to direct it she made for it. She used it against the enemy in a feat that to distant days shall be remembered. The skies were like red-hued wool in color. The explosive beam tore apart the enemy, made him with his hand clutch his heart. Although tablets 5 through 8 are too damaged to be properly read, partial verses suggest that after the intensified attack with Ishtar's assistance, there arose a great cry and lamentation in the enemy land. Fear of Ninur's brilliance encompassed the land, and its residents had to use substitutes instead of wheat and barley to grind and mill as flour. Under this onslaught, the enemy forces kept retreating south. At that point, Ninurta led the Enlilite gods in an attack on the heartland of Nergal's African domain and his temple city, Meslam. Sitchin explains that these verses describing this aspect of the war are damaged but its details are available from various other fragmented tablets that deal with the overwhelming of the land by Ninurta, a feat whereby he earned the title Vanquisher of Meshlam. In these battles, the attackers apparently resorted to chemical warfare. We read that Ninurta rained on the city poison-bearing missiles, which he catapulted into it. The poison by itself destroyed the city. Those who survived the attack on the city escaped to the surrounding mountains. But Ninurta, with the weapon that smites through fire upon the mountains, the godly weapon of the gods, whose tooth is bitter, smote down the people. Here, too, some kind of chemical warfare is indicated. The weapon which tears apart robbed the senses. The tooth skinned them off. Tearing apart, he stretched upon the land. The canals he filled with blood, in the enemy land for dogs like milk to lick. Overwhelmed by the merciless onslaught, Azag called on his followers to show no resistance. The arisen enemy to his wife and child called. Against the Lord Ninurta he raised not his arm. The weapons of Kerr with soil were covered. 
Ninurta believed the lack of resistance was a sign of victory. After Ninurta killed the opponents occupying the land of the Harzag, the Sinai, and went on to attack the gods in Kur, he defeated them in the mountains. He then burst out in a song of victory. My fearsome brilliance like Anu's is mighty. Against it, who can rise? I am lord of the high mountains, of the mountains which to the horizon raise their peaks. In the mountains, I am the master. But the claim of victory was premature. By his non-resistant tactics, Azag had escaped defeat. Although the capital city was destroyed, the enemy leaders were not. The text state, the scorpion of Kerr, Ninurta did not annihilate. Instead, the enemy gods retreated into the Great Pyramid, where the wise craftsmen, Inki, Thoth, raised up a protective wall, which the brilliance could not match. In essence, it was a shield through which the death rays could not penetrate. Sitchin reveals that our knowledge of this final and most dramatic phase of the Second Pyramid War is augmented by text from the other side. Just as Ninurta's followers composed hymns to him, so did the followers of Nergal. The text explained that as the other gods found themselves within the Giza complex, Nergal, lofty dragon beloved of the Ecker, at night stole out and, carrying awesome weapons and accompanied by his lieutenants, broke through the encirclement to reach the Great Pyramid. Reaching it at night, he entered through the locked doors which by themselves can open. A roar of welcome greeted him as he entered. Divine Nergal, Lord who by night stole out, had come to the battle. He cracks his whip, his weapons clank. He who is welcome, his might is immense. Like a dream at the doorstep he appeared. Divine Nergal, the one who is welcome. Fight the enemy of Ecker. Lay hold on the wild one from Nipper. But the optimism of the besieged gods was short-lived. We learn more of the last phases of this pyramid war from yet another text, first pieced together by George A. Barton in his book Miscellaneous Babylonian Text from fragments of an inscribed clay cylinder found in the ruins of Enlil's temple in Nippur. As Nergal joined the defenders of the Great Pyramid, he strengthened its defenses through the various ray-emitting crystals positioned within the pyramid. The Water Stone, the Apex Stone, the Stone. The Lord Nergal increased its strength. The door for protection he, to heaven its eye he raised, dug deep that which gives life. In the house, he fed them food. With the enhanced pyramid defenses, Ninurta resorted to another tactic. He called upon Utu to cut off the pyramid's water supply. The text here is too mutilated to enable a reading of the details, but the tactic apparently achieved its purpose. Sitchin informs us, quote, huddled in their last stronghold, cut off from food and water, the besieged gods did their best to ward off their attackers. Until then, in spite of the veracity of the battles, no major god had fallen a casualty to the fighting. But now, one of the younger gods, Horus, we believe, trying to sneak out of the Great Pyramid disguised as a ram, was struck by Ninurta's brilliant weapon and lost the sight of his eyes. An Odin god then cried out to Ninharzag, reputed for her medical wonders to save the young god's life. At that time, the killing brightness came. The house's platform withstood the Lord. Unto Ninharzag there was an outcry. The weapon, my offspring, with death is accursed. Other Sumerian texts called this young god offspring who did not know his father, an epithet befitting Horus who was born after his father's death. In Egyptian lore, the legend of the ram reports the injuries to the eyes of Horus when a god blew fire at him. It was then, responding to the outcry, that Ninharzag decided to intervene to stop the fighting. The ninth tablet of the text begins with the statement of Ninharzag to her son Ninurta, the son of Enlil, the legitimate heir whom the sister wife had brought forth. To the house where the cord measuring begins, where Asar his eyes to Anu raised, I shall go. The cord I will cut off for the sake of the warring gods. 
Her destination was the house where cord measuring begins, the Great Pyramid. Ninurta was first astounded by her decision, but since her mind was made up, he provided her with clothes which should make her unafraid. As she neared the pyramid, she addressed Inky. The exchanges are lost by the breaks in the tablet, but Inky agreed to surrender the pyramid to her. The house that is like a heap, that which I have as a pile raised up, its mistress you may be. There was, however, a caveat. The surrender was subject to a final resolution of the conflict. Promising to relay Inky's conditions, Ninharzag went to address Enlil. Sitchin points out that the events that followed are recorded in part in the Lugal epic and in other fragmentary texts, but they are most dramatically described in a text titled I Sing the Song of the Mother of the Gods, surviving in great length because it was copied and recopied throughout the ancient Near East. It is a poetic text in praise of Ninma, the Great Lady, and her role as Mammy, Mother of Gods, on both sides of the battle lines opening with a call upon the comrades in arms and the combatants to listen the poem briefly describes the warfare and its participants as well as its nearly global extent on the one side were the firstborn of ninma ninurta and adad soon joined by sin and later on by inanna on the opposing side are listed nergal a god referred to as mighty lofty one which was marduk and the god of the two great houses, the two great pyramids of Giza, who had tried to escape camouflaged in a ram's skin, which was Horus. With the approval of Anu, Ninharzag took the surrender offer of Enki to Enlil. She met with him in the presence of a dad while Ninurta remained at the battlefield. Oh, hear my prayers, she begged the two gods as she explained her ideas. A dad was at first adamant. Presenting himself there to the mother, a dad thus said, We are expecting victory. The enemy forces are beaten. The trembling of the land he could not withstand. If she wants to bring about a secession of hostilities, a dad said, let her call discussions on the basis that the Enlilites are about to win. Get up and go. Talk to the enemy. Let him attend the discussions so that the attack be withdrawn. Enlil, in less forceful language, supported the suggestion. Enlil opened his mouth. In the assembly of the gods, he said, Whereas Anu at the mountain the gods assembled, warfare to discourage, peace to bring, and has dispatched the mother of the gods to entreat with me, let the mother of the gods be an emissary. Turning to his sister, he said in a conciliatory vein, Go, appease my brother. Raise unto him a hand for life. From his barred doorway, let him come out. Following Enlil's suggestion, Ninharzag informed Enki that his safety and that of his sons was assured. She then led the defenders out of the Great Pyramid to her abode in the Harzag as Ninurta and his warriors observed their departure. And the great and impregnable structure stood unoccupied and silent. Sitchin states, quote, Nowadays, visitors to the Great Pyramid find its passages and chambers bare and empty, its complex inner construction apparently purposeless, its niches and nooks meaningless. It has been so ever since the first men had entered the pyramid, but it was not so when Ninurta had entered it, circa 8670 BCE, according to our calculations. Until the radiant place yielded by its defenders Ninurta had entered, the Sumerian text relates, and what he had done after he had entered changed not only the Great Pyramid from within and without, but also the course of human affairs." End quote. When Ninurta went into the Great Pyramid, he must have wondered what he would find inside. Conceived by Enki, planned by Ra, built by Geb, equipped by Thoth, defended by Nergal, what mysteries of space guidance, what secrets of impregnable defense did it hold?" End quote. On the north face of the pyramid, the text explained that a swivel stone swung open to reveal the entranceway to Ninurta. After following the straight descending passage to the lower service chambers, Ninurta could see a shaft dug by the defenders in search for subterranean water, but he was more interested in the upper passages and chambers. 
That is where the magical stones were arrayed, some earthly, some heavenly, some the likes of which he had never seen. The stones beamed pulsations for the guidance of the astronauts and the radiations for the defense of the structure. As Ninurta inspected the array of stones and instruments, he placed them in three categories. They would be smashed up and destroyed, taken away for display, or salvaged as instruments elsewhere. Sitchin tells us that we know of these destinies and of the order in which Ninurta had stopped by the stones from the text inscribed on tablets 10 through 13 of the epic poem. It is by following and correctly interpreting this text that the mystery of the purpose and function of many features of the pyramid's inner structure can be finally understood. Sitchin's interpretation of the last four tablets is as follows, quote, Going up the ascending passage, Ninurta reached its junction with the imposing Grand Gallery and a horizontal passage. Ninurta followed the horizontal passage first, reaching a large chamber with a corbelled roof. Called the Volva in the Ninharzag poem, the chamber's axis lay exactly on the east-west center line of the pyramid. Its emission, an outpouring which is like a lion whom no one dares attack, came from a stone fitted into a niche that was hollowed out in the east wall. It was the sham, destiny stone, emitting a red radiance which Ninurta saw in the darkness. It was the pulsating heart of the pyramid. But it was an anathema to Ninurta, for during the battle when he was aloft, the stone's strong power was used to grab to kill me with a tracking which kills to seize me. He ordered it pulled out, be taken apart, and to obliteration be destroyed. Returning to the junction of the passages, Ninurta looked around him in the Grand Gallery. As ingenious and complex as the whole pyramid was, this gallery was breathtaking and a most unusual sight. Compared to the low and narrow passages, it rose high, some 28 feet, in seven overlapping stages, its walls closing in ever more at each stage. The ceiling was also built in slanting sections, each one angled into the massive wall so as not to exert any pressure on the segment below it. Whereas in the narrow passages only a dim green light glowed, the gallery glittered in multicolored lights. Its vault is like a rainbow, the darkness ends there. The many hued glows were emitted by 27 pairs of diverse crystal stones that were evenly spaced along the whole length of each side of the gallery. These glowing stones were placed in cavities that were precisely cut into the ramps that ran the length of the gallery on both sides of its floor. Firmly held in place by an elaborate niche in the wall, each crystal stone emitted a different radiance, giving the place its rainbow effect. For the moment, Ninurta passed by them on his way up. His priority was the uppermost grand chamber and its pulsating stone. Atop the grand gallery, Ninurta reached a great step which led through a low passage to an antechamber of unique design. There, three portcullises, the bolt, the bar, and the lock of the Sumerian poem, elaborately fitted into grooves in the walls and floor, hermetically sealed off the uppermost great chamber. To foe it is not opened, only to them who live, for them it is opened. But now, by pulling some cords, the portcullises were raised, and Ninurta passed through. He was now in the pyramid's most restricted, sacred chamber, from which the guiding net was spread out to survey heaven and earth. The delicate mechanism was housed in a hollowed-out stone chest, Placed precisely on the north-south axis of the pyramid, it responded to vibrations with bell-like resonance. The heart of the guidance unit was the gug, direction-determining stone. Its emissions, amplified by five hollow compartments constructed above the chamber, were beamed out and up through two sloping channels leading to the north and south faces of the pyramid. Ninurta ordered the stone destroyed. Then by the fate determining Ninurta on that day was the gug stone from its hollow taken out and smashed. To make sure no one would ever attempt to restore the direction determining functions of the pyramid, Ninurta also ordered the three portcullises removed. First to be tackled were the SU, vertical stone, and the Kashura, awesome pure which opens stone. 
Then the hero stepped up to the Sagkal stone, sturdy stone which is in front. He called out his full strength, shook it out of its grooves, cut the cords that were holding it, and to the ground set its course. Now came the turn of the mineral stones and crystals positioned atop the ramps in the grand gallery. As he walked down, Ninurta stopped by each one of them to declare its fate. Were it not for the breaks in the clay tablets on which the text was written, we would have had the names of all twenty-seven of them. As it is, only twenty-two names are legible. Several of them Ninurta ordered to be crushed or pulverized, others which could be used in the new mission control center were ordered given to Utu, and the rest were carried off to Mesopotamia to be displayed in Ninurta's temple in Nippur and elsewhere as constant evidence of the great victory of the Enlilites over the Inki gods. Finally, there was the apex stone of the pyramid, the Yule, high as the sky stone. Let the mother's offspring see it no more, he ordered, and the stone was sent crashing down. End quote. The deed having been done, Ninurta's comrades urged him to leave the battleground and return home. Sitchin concludes that at this point, quote, the Second Pyramid War was over, but its ferocity and feats and Ninurta's final victory at the Pyramids of Giza were remembered long thereafter in epic and song, and in a remarkable drawing on a cylinder seal, showing Ninurta's divine bird within a victory wreath, soaring in triumph above the two great pyramids. <laughs>